Hi, I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo with another episode of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, where our goal is the improvement of our entire world with a particular focus on the local African American community. Today's episode is wonderful. We're talking about lots of orthopedic um, issues, orthopedic health, health overall. So and I have a great uh, guest here with me, Dr. Sean Price, who is an absolute expert on orthopedic issues. And you probably want to ask, what are orthopedic issues? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But introduce yourself or tell us about yourself, uh, Dr. Sure. Price. My name is Sean Price. I am uh, originally <laughs> from Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, I've been in Louisville for about 10 years uh, come August. My wife and I uh, moved here back in 2011. Um, I did my undergrad training and medical school uh, training at The Ohio State University. All right. I completed my uh, residency at Penn State University. And uh, I did a fellowship in musculoskeletal oncology uh, at the University of Utah. Um, so I take care of both general orthopedic conditions in addition to um, oncologic conditions that affect the musculoskeletal system. Awesome, awesome. So, wow, you've been around. Yeah. Okay, so went from the Midwest all the way to the East and then all the way to the, to the, to West. the, uh, to the West. Yeah. And so now you're back here. So what brought you to Louisville? So my wife is a physician as well. And mm -hmm. sometimes when you are a physician couple, it can mm -hmm. be a little challenging trying Dual. to find yeah. um, positions that work out for the best of you, uh, for both of us. And so that was uh, uh, our challenge. And we mm -hmm. found that Louisville would get us closer to home for both of us uh, and also would allow us to practice uh, in our respective fields. Awesome, awesome. So you allude, we were alluded a little bit to some of the things that you see. So tell our audience what kinds of conditions you actually see in your practice um, and, you know, just give us, you know, a little bit more information. Sure. About that. So from a general orthopedic standpoint, you know, I see patients from head to toe. Um, while I don't surgically take care of back pain, I am fine managing and happy to manage patients uh, back pain non-operatively. If it gets mm -hmm. to a point where their uh, back pain is uh, to a point where it requires surgery, then I usually refer those patients out. Um, same thing with shoulders. I do shoulder replacement surgery. I don't do a whole lot of rotator cuff uh, repairs and things of that sort, but when it comes to arthritis or fracture care and things of that mm -hmm. sort, I take care of that. Um, hip and knee replacements, um, you know, I do that. Sprains, you name it. Whenever okay. there's any type of orthopedic injury, you know, I'm happy to address it. And if I feel like it's outside of my wheelhouse, you know, from a surgical standpoint, then mm -hmm. I'm happy to refer patients on uh, to someone who I feel is, is good and will take good care of them. Okay, so you deal with arthritis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get into that in just a little bit. Sure. So you deal with arthritis, uh, you perform surgeries mm -hmm. um, in terms of like fractures, but also repairs, mm -hmm. and then sports injuries, mm -hmm. you know, also. Wow, yeah. so that's pretty I broad. do some sports injuries. I don't do a whole lot of, you know, ACL reconstructions and things of that sort. Again, mm -hmm. you know, I'm happy to manage those things if they are amenable to non-operative treatment. But it's been so long, honestly, since I've done some of those surgeries, mm -hmm. you know, it's probably better that I not do them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to make sure that the patients are getting, you know, the appropriate treatment. Right, right. And so you're from kind of like a sports city, this, you know, Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. this is, we consider ourselves to be a sports city here yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky. So, sure. yeah, just wanted to, to, to ask about that. Now, uh, in terms of, you also have kind of like a subspecialty mm -hmm. in terms of, orthopedic oncology. Could right. you kind of explain sure. a little bit about that? And you know, I get that question a lot because mm -hmm. a lot of people just are not familiar with orthopedic oncology. Mm -hmm. And so um, orthopedics, again, is head to toe, bones and joints. Okay. Um, and oncology obviously is cancer. And so um, any cancer that potentially arises in the musculoskeletal system, whether that is involving muscle, cartilage, joints, um, uh, connective tissues, uh, all of those things, I have uh, undergone additional training to take care of those patients. Okay. In addition to that, there are cancers that may originate in other places, uh, particularly in our community would be breast cancer, prostate mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. and those cancers can also metastasize or spread to the bone. Sometimes they can cause bone pain, sometimes they can predispose to uh, fracture, and mm -hmm. so it's important for patients you know, who may be diagnosed with and uh, malignancy that involves an organ to be mindful of their pain and uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that they're getting at the dress because sometimes that pain may not be just related to arthritis or uh, related to bone pain that sometimes can happen after uh, treatment 
with uh, chemotherapy, it may be an underlying lesion that okay. could predispose them to a fracture. Okay, and you can actually take care of that potentially. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That's really great to know that. So, um, a lot of people deal with arthritis. Mm -hmm. Okay, especially as we. I know for myself, as I age, you know, I used to hear the old folks talking about arthritis, sure. and, and now I'm dealing with it myself. So mm -hmm. can you kind of explain, um, just, you know, for all of us, what is arthritis overall, um, the causes for arthritis, um, and then the common areas where, you know, we're being affected. I know for me, I have it like in my hand. So could you kind of talk about that a little bit? Sure. More? So arthritis <laughs> um, basically is an inflammation in the joint. Um, and it is also a degenerative process uh, whereby the cartilage that's mm -hmm. inside the joint has uh, undergone a process of deterioration. Mm -hmm. there, and that's a from aging, huh? So it can be from it. aging, okay. <laughs> for sure. Okay. Uh, and then we have to think about uh, autoimmune type causes mm -hmm. of uh, arthritis, whether it's uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. People who have psoriasis can have uh, psoriatic arthritis. Mm -hmm. People who develop gout can develop gouty arthritis okay. or arthropathy. And then we also have to consider infectious etiologies or infectious causes of arthritis as well. And so sometimes certain infections can go into the joint and destroy the joint. Um, lastly would be patients who have hemophilia. Sometimes those mm. patients can have bleeds into their joints and with patients who've had repetitive bleeds into their joints, that can deteriorate the cartilage and uh, oh, wow. cause arthritis as well. The most common by far is osteoarthritis and that is you know, what we consider to be wear and tear right. arthritis. And some people may be predisposed to developing arthritis because mm -hmm. of uh, a family, um, you know, predisposition to it. But some people just develop it, you know, because of their type of work that they're doing, um, whether they were very athletic and had a sports type of injury, mm -hmm. uh, and just day-to-day -day wear and tear. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the cartilage over time just slowly deteriorates. Unlike other aspects of our body, the cartilage is what we consider to be avascular, meaning that it does not have a blood supply, mm -hmm. so it does not have the propensity to repair itself that we normally see in other parts of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so over time, once that cartilage starts to deteriorate, it will slowly continue to deteriorate until uh, you get a point of inflammation within the, the mm -hmm. lining of the joint, and then, then it becomes just a vicious cycle of inflammation, pain, stiffness, and things of that sort. Wow. Ooh, that's a lot. So where are the main areas where we're seeing arthritis? I know that uh, a lot of people complain of it in their hips and, and also in their knees, but what are the most common areas that you yeah, see? Yeah, that's just that, hips and mm -hmm. knees by far. Okay. You can also get it in your shoulders. Okay. Uh, you can also get it in your ankles. Um, the hands are often a common place for mm -hmm. them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so people who have rheumatoid arthritis, um, can sometimes have a variety of deformities about their hands. In addition to patients who have osteoarthritis of their hands, they too can have that as well. Okay, and you touched a little bit about gout, mm -hmm. gouty arthritis, and we hear about that being mostly in the in the big toe, but mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to occur just in the big toe. You can have it in other areas, excuse me. That's true, you definitely can, but it definitely has a predisposition for the smaller joints, but bigger joints can definitely be involved. Okay, so as a orthopedic surgeon, like where is your role in terms of helping with arthritis? So we hear, you know, you're a surgeon, so you're going to be taking, taking them to the operating room or doing surgery, but are there non-surgical options that, you know, you can talk about when it comes to arthritis specifically? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, if you come into my office, the first thing I'm not going to, I'm not going to recommend, you know, surgery right away if there are other modifiable things that we can address. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing would be weight. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if we can take off weight, and lose weight, then that oftentimes will help us and help patients a lot with, um, you know, their joints and, and how they feel. And when okay. patients are successful in getting into a weight management plan, uh, they often see a significant improvement in their joint pain. Okay. Other things would be physical therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes physical therapy is beneficial in working um, the muscles around the joints mm -hmm. to make sure that those are nice and strong and stable. Um, Bef uh, before we consider doing anything other than, you know, surgery. Then lastly are some more invasive, but not mm -hmm. as invasive as surgery, and that would be injections and things of that sort. Other, you know, non-operative treatments would be medications. Uh, so we talk about anti-inflammatory medications, so Advil, Motrin, Aleve, and sometimes those medications may require a prescription. Um, there's uh, Mobic and Celebrex, mm -hmm. and there are a, a lot of medications that we can try. 
topical ointments and cream, capsaicin. Uh, now Voltaren gel is over the counter, which right. sometimes helps out a lot of people. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do um, from a non-operative standpoint uh, before we get to surgery. Okay, so there's lots of different options sure. before you need to actually take someone to the operating room. Right. So the first thing that you mentioned though was losing weight. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit how weight actually affects the joints in that, in that way? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously if we're standing, um, you know, that load is being transmitted from, you know, our bodies all mm -hmm. the way down, you know, to the ground. And when we go up and down stairs, the joint reactive forces that our joints see as a result of that increase, you know, exponentially, honestly. Okay. And so if we can shed some of that weight, then um, the joints see less pressure. And as a result of that, um, they undergo less deterioration okay. and uh, less strain. Okay, okay. Less wear and tear on our bodies Absolutely. just overall. Well, yeah. Great, great. And you also mentioned topical therapy. So we, you know, you mentioned things like uh, capsaicin and then also Voltaren. Mm -hmm. What about things that you can also get over the counter, um, which I know Voltaren is now, mm -hmm. but um, like aspirin cream or like the things like Ben Gay and things like that. Yeah. How do those work and how do they? You know, work those for your system? those are all just kind of topical analgesics, you know, primarily, and so mm -hmm. those have um, you know a variety of different effects. Some are beneficial for some. Okay. Some are not. I tell patients to try whatever it is they want to try, and whatever works mm -hmm. for them, continue to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so I will usually try um, uh, or recommend aspirin cream. Biofreeze, you know, mm. capsation, okay. generic muscle rub. If those things work, great. If they don't, then the next step from there would be uh, a topical Voltaren gel or a different type of, um, you know, topical medication that we can apply okay. um, that some patients actually get good relief from. So th sometimes the question is like heat versus cold mm -hmm. and how do you determine that for for people when That's they're in a good pain? question i don't think we have a good answer to mm -hmm. that um i usually tell people um you know from myself when i'm exercising and working out i usually say you know you want to warm up the joint if you're going to be you know getting ready to you know involve uh, yourself in some mm -hmm. activities so you know warming it up if you're going to be up uh, and moving around to try to loosen it up and then mm -hmm. once you're done with your activity cooling down uh, the joint uh, mm -hmm. to kind of help with some of the inflammation that may happen as a result of those activities. Okay, okay. And also there's things like chiropractic maneuvers, there's kneeling, other kinds of, I wouldn't say out there types of things, mm -hmm. but just not as commonly you know, seen in, sure. in the way that we're trained in terms of Western medicine. Mm -hmm. What do you think about those things? You know, I always tell patients, I you know, approach all of these things with an open mind. Okay. Um, I don't shut off any other therapy that you know, a patient may find beneficial. Uh, okay. When I was in medical, stu uh, medical school, I actually had acupuncture on my shoulder. Mm. And it Did worked, it help? It worked well for me. Okay. But okay. for some patients, it doesn't. So, um, you know, I'm just willing, I'm willing to work with them, you know, with whatever they want to try. Um, my main thing is, you know, just making sure that those therapies don't potentially have an adverse interaction with any other type of medications okay. or other therapies that they may be involved with. Okay, okay. I just had a, an issue that I have dealt with, um, with back pain, mm -hmm. and there's this thought that stress can play a role with, um, with just, you know, pain just in general. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that in terms of just stress? Because I know, know, like, I was really stressed and I started having a lot of back pain. Yeah, so. I think we underestimate the effects that stress can have on our bodies mm -hmm. um, and just our general health. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can't tell you and quote any specific literature that say that there's right. a direct correlation between stress and arthritis, but I think that, you know, maintaining a nice, healthy lifestyle, a good diet mm -hmm. and exercise, and, um, you know, minimizing stressors and having good mm -hmm. coping techniques are going to be beneficial, you know, just for your overall well-being. Okay, okay. Maybe I'll ask your wife that question when she comes on. <laughs> yes. There you go. Okay. So just in terms of the surgeries themselves, mm -hmm. what is involved when someone gets their hip replaced? And when someone gets their knee replaced and yeah. how should someone prepare for those surgeries yeah so i think the best preparation um, is taking care of yourself mm -hmm. and making sure you're in the best health that you can possibly be in uh, oftentimes when you have stiffness of the joints um, whether it's hip knees shoulders ankles we like to try to get as much motion out of those joints mm -hmm. as we can okay. before we get to the operating room 
because the operating uh, or the operative procedure itself will sometimes you know make the joint stiffer so right. if we can get as much motion out of that joint as we can before we take it to the operating room then that's usually my goal um, when it comes to um, the replacement process itself, what we do is, is we replace wherever there is uh, cartilage. So in the hip, you have a ball and you have a socket, both mm -hmm. of which are lined mm -hmm. with cartilage. Mm -hmm. So uh, we take out the cartilage in the socket and then that is replaced with what we call a liner. And then inside that, um, that liner is usually a polyethylene or a ceramic um, kind of bearing surface. Okay. And then on the femur side or the thigh bone side, we usually cut off the bone itself, the, um, the ball portion of the femur, and then we put a stem, a metal stem, inside of the femur, and then on that stem is another bearing surface, which is a ball. Uh, and so the ball now will articulate or move with that new surface that we created in the hip socket. Oh, when it wow. comes to the knee, we do the same thing, except we make you know special cuts in the distal femur or the, the uh, lower portion of the thigh bone mm -hmm. um, and then we make a flat cut on the upper part of the lower leg bone, put metal on there and then in between that metal is a plastic kind of bushing so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of the same thing in the hip. We just take out the arthritis or the shoulder. Mm -hmm. We kind of take out the arthritis and replace it uh, with metal and often with a plastic line. Okay. So it's almost like you're going in, taking out the the degenerative portion mm -hmm. or the things that have been damaged and then putting something kind of new aligning in and something that's, that's right yeah that's right okay and then in terms of just I guess it depends on the person recovery and you know all of that I've seen people who are able to come out within you know 24 hours or a day or so whereas in the past gosh they'd be in the hospital for possibly a week or so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. With my training, um, patients were in the hospital for about three to five days, sometimes mm -hmm. longer after mm -hmm. a hip or knee replacement. And now with newer um, uh, anesthetic uh, type or anesthesia type mm -hmm. techniques, mm -hmm. we're able to get patients, some patients home the same day. Okay. Um, and most times patients are being discharged, you know, the, at least the day after um, that surgery. The main thing that keeps patients in the hospital tends to be pain. And so yeah, because of yeah. those new, uh, what we call regional anesthetics or nerve blocks, mm -hmm. we're able to help control that pain for a longer period of time than we were, uh, than what we were before. And so patients are able to get home okay. uh, a lot sooner. Most patients are, you know, for hip and knee replacement, as long as there's no complication in the operating room, you're walking on it the day of your surgery. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And we usually get you involved with therapy that day um, and then get you set up with home health um, and home mm -hmm. therapy mm -hmm. uh, prior to you going home. Okay. So in terms of just them coming out, you still you still recommend like being on things that prevent them from getting blood clots because that is Absolutely. something that... Okay. Can Absolutely. you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So after, you know really any orthopedic procedure, probably with the exception of upper extremities, we always get a concern about just mobility mm -hmm. um, and blood clots. And so when you are less mobile, the blood has an opportunity to pool in our veins and as a okay. result of that can clot. And so most of us, I shouldn't say most, all orthopedic surgeons, right. you know, from who are doing hips and knees will put you on some form of medication to help thin out your blood whether that's an aspirin or some people are doing mm -hmm. Coumadin, uh, some people do a variety of the other anticoagulative mm -hmm. medications, but that can definitely be expected after the surgery. Okay, so just kind of expect that to be on yes. a blood thinner a certain period of time for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier about some of the new technologies. Could you talk about, you know, about anything that's new or coming down the pipeline when it comes to um, surgical procedures or just things that maybe even in the office that you do have heard of, you know, PRP or things so like that? So as far as the surgeries itself, mm -hmm. I think the newest you know, type of technology is our navigation, um, mm -hmm. where we um, can use a computer, uh, having oh. simulated or, uh, your leg, usually with a CT scan, you do um, a simulated cut uh, within the, oh, the wow. femur to make sure that our cuts are accurate. Um, and then there's also robotic assisted yes, type yes. of surgeries where, um, you know, a lot of our instrumentation is connected to robots uh, that kind of help guide us as well. Mm -hmm. um, some of that stuff is, you know, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it's a little bit more fiddle factor um, <laughs> and can sometimes increase the operative time. Um, and I, you know, it's, I would not hang your hat on having your knee replaced by, you know, a robot right. or, you know, by navigation because, you know, there really isn't uh, a significant benefit 
uh, imparted by using those technologies. Right. As you, just this visual came uh, to my mind when you were talking about that of the Six Million Dollar Man. I don't know, maybe too young to remember <laughs> that show, yeah, but I've heard uh, of yeah, it. that's yeah. a very interesting show. But um, just, I want to know are there conditions that are more prevalent um, that you find in the African American community when it comes to orthopedic health or, uh, or that you see? Um, um, I wouldn't say there's a huge predilection for anything that we are seeing more of. Okay. Uh, we always know about the disparities. I think that sometimes mm -hmm. we um, are probably, you know, lagging behind some of our peers in getting the appropriate treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say that there's mm -hmm. a pre uh, predilection for, you know, a certain type of arthritis over another or anything like that at all. And why, you know, there's a significant delay in that, it's kind of hard to say. Mm -hmm. From a musculoskeletal oncologic standpoint, we know that um, you know, sarcomas in general are very rare, um, and we're talking about 1% of all cancers, about 14,000 oh, wow. soft tissue sarcomas diagnosed okay. a year, about 1,500 primary bone tumors, mm. and surprisingly, we are not in the majority of uh, those patients who encounter those. However, okay. when we are diagnosed with those, um, we do know that we are at a delay, or there is a significant delay mm -hmm. in diagnosis, and treatment of those type of uh, musculoskeletal conditions. So that is one mm -hmm. thing that there's definitely mm -hmm. a, a disparity uh, as far as treatment. But fortunately, it's not something that we see as far as primary bone tumors and things okay. of that sort. Okay. But from a general orthopedic standpoint, you know, I, I can't really put my finger on you know one particular thing and say that you know our community is definitely more affected you know by this thing than our counterparts. Whew, good. <laughs> that's at yeah. least in this field that that's a, a great thing sure. because in other fields we definitely see much more you know prevalence for us you know unfortunately. So and speaking of delay um, does delayed diagnosis of, of certain conditions concern you especially because you know in this we're in this pandemic mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who are delaying going in to see their doctors does that mm -hmm. concern you? when it comes to what you do? Yeah, not from a general orthopedic standpoint mm -hmm. because from general orthopedics, a lot of what we do is elective. You know, mm -hmm. even though you have arthritis, there's no, you know, absolute need yeah. for us to do a replacement if you can still manage your symptoms. However, from the standpoint of orthopedic oncology uh, and those type of can and, um, cancers that go to the bone, then mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I alluded to that a little bit earlier that we should be, um, if you have a history of a cancer um, and you're starting to have new pains or aches mm -hmm. in places that you hadn't before, you know, I would not delay, you know, being evaluated absolutely. for those. A simple x-ray picture, you know, can, you know, prove significantly beneficial in um, uh, minimizing the type of surgery that you may have to have um, if it goes on longer. Okay, so absolutely make sure that we are getting you know, our screenings and if we're having any symptoms at all, right. definitely going in to see, you know, primary care physician or if right. you're blessed enough to have you as a yeah. physician also. Right. All right. So speaking of COVID-19, how has COVID-19, this pandemic affected you, um, you know, in your practice? Yeah. So I start, uh, set up my solo practice in March of oh. 2020. Oh, and so, right. Wow. Right as things, <laughs> right were, as things yeah. were shutting down. Yeah. But fortunately, um, you know, we've been able to continue and uh, practice is demonstrating growth. Good. But uh, it definitely was, you know, a struggle. Um, but, you know, we've persevered and continue to, you know, do what I can to help take care of people. Talk about just getting yourself into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was a uh, Hmm, either very great timing. We're going to say that's great timing. <laughs> I wouldn't timing. say it was great timing, yes. not at all. Very interesting timing. Exactly. Well, speaking of which, where is your office and how can people reach you? And are you accepting new patients? Yeah, I'm absolutely accepting new patients. And my office is at the corner of Hurstbourne and Westport Road. Um, the address is 9407 Westport okay. Road, Suite 110. And I'm in a shared space with a, a colleague who's a, who's a podiatrist. Um, and... To reach my office, it's 502-916-6163. Awesome, awesome. So on this show, Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, we do a lot of talking about health and wellness, but we also want to be about it. So, Dr. Sean Price, what do you do to promote health for your own self? Uh, spend too much time at the gym is what my <laughs> wife would say. So I enjoy running. Uh, okay. I recently taken up cycling and I go okay. to the gym and I lift weights. Um, so those things are uh, my stress relievers and things that I took okay. on uh, when I started going into uh, when I started medical school 
And so that's kind of been my outlet and my way of uh, uh, decompressing and relaxing. So Awesome, awesome. So there's no concern in terms of like, if you have any sports injuries or, or have any issues, you're not going to treat yourself, are you? No. <laughs> so you <laughs> no. have a go-to person that you do Yeah, okay. I try, but I also lift smart. I'm not one of the okay. guys in the gym who's throwing a lot of weight around. Uh, I try to lift smart. No also, pun intended, That's huh? right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I um, also do yoga uh, oh, to try to okay. stretch. And I uh, have, I wouldn't say I'm completely plant-based as far as diet, but I eat meat a couple of times a week. But primarily okay. other than that, I'm, you know, kind of vegan, vegetarian, depending okay. on the day. So You brought up a really great point that I meant to bring up earlier food, mm -hmm. how, does that play a role in what you see in terms of arthritis specifically? Um, and and, and yeah. specific arthritis is like gout. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that, you know, I'm by no means an expert in gout, and I have to defer mm -hmm. to my wife on mm -hmm. that, but we do know that certain foods, right, certain foods can predispose you to gouty flares, um, alcohol, okay. um, fatty food, or not fatty foods, but meats and things of that sort. Okay. Um, what about how you cook it also? Well, that, that I can't really tell you. I'm not 100% sure okay. on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, inflammation, there are definitely certain foods that can, mm -hmm. you know, predispose to inflammatory states within our bodies that we should be mindful of. Um, okay. I personally, you know, I'm a big proponent of um, fat soluble vitamins and uh, mm -hmm. anti, um, um, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E, mm -hmm. um, vitamin D. Um, and there's actually, a lot of talk about vitamin D. Vitamin yeah. D is definitely the hot topic now. We yes. do know that there's at least some kind of association with vitamin D insufficiency and vitamin D deficiency that can predispose to um, arthritis in addition mm. to vitamin K deficiency. So mm. okay. definitely some things out there. Right. And so in our community, because one of the ways you do synthesize vitamin D is from the sun's exposures, mm -hmm. but when you're darker skin, you may not right. have as much vitamin D. So with that Gosh, it may be a little bit of predisposition That's for right. us in terms of just And I won't say I check it in all of my um, patients, or especially my African-American patients, mm -hmm. um, but when there is a fracture, I definitely check okay. it because we do know that low vitamin D can slum sometimes slow down bone healing. So I will usually check it and replace it as needed. Okay, okay. You know, what's interesting is that um, just being a, a, a basketball city, mm -hmm. I remember when the University of Louisville basketball player when they were actually playing several years ago and he on air mm -hmm. had a fracture mm -hmm. right on air and yeah. i think you know just looking back on that i thought hmm what was his vitamin d level yeah. you know just right. interesting yeah. you know kind of concept so sure. yeah well thank you yeah. any last uh, uh, words of advice or anything that you would like to give to our audience in terms of orthopedic care or orthopedic health yeah so health. i would just say you know one, one thing that we didn't talk about mm -hmm. was exercise in mm -hmm. arthritis. So okay. it's a common thing that people think that because their, joint, their joints hurt um, or that they're stiff that you, know, you shouldn't exercise. I mentioned earlier that cartilage is, is a uh, avascular uh, structure, doesn't have a blood supply, and mm -hmm. as a result, cartilage needs motion and it needs pressure in order for it to stay nourished. So I would encourage you, even if those mm -hmm. joints hurt, do the best that you can to stay as mobile as you can and just get up and move. All right, well on that note, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Healthy Mind, Body and Spirit. Where our goal is the improvement of the entire world but with a particular focus on the local African-American community. So let's get moving, get you moving. know, get moving. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.